Get ready, Ohio. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, is coming to the Buckeye State. And to kick things off, you can get started with $100 in free bets as an early sign-up bonus. Plus, when you sign up today with promo code OHIOSB, you'll be all set for when FanDuel goes live in Ohio. Then you can bet on all your favorite teams and all your favorite sports with $100 in free bets. Just download FanDuel's top-rated sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Ohio, this is your chance to get in on the action. Join today with promo code OHIOSB. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. 21 plus and present in Ohio. Bonus issued in non-withdrawable free bets that expire seven days after FanDuel accepts its first real money sports wager in Ohio on one Unique user identity verification required. Offer ends on the go-live date. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Hey folks, welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Mason. Geez, it must be horse week or something here at ASP because uh, on Monday we featured Ben Masters who who rode wild Mustangs from Mexico to Canada. And today we're throwing it back to Nancy Pfeiffer who uh, did this amazing, not di- is doing this amazing decades long journey through Patagonia on horseback. Uh, as you'll hear, she started out as a novice horsewoman uh, took off across Patagonia alone on horseback. Talk about an epic journey. And over the next two decades and 3,000 plus kilometers of e- extremely rugged horse trail, uh, she learned so much about the culture, about the way of life, uh, and about the place of Patagonia. And now she is even uh, a guide to that area. She published the book that we're talking about, a rugged uh, riding into the heart of Patagonia. It was released in May 2018. It's available on Amazon. There's a link in the show notes. And uh, when she's not in Patagonia, she lives in a cabin outside Palmer, Alaska, where she enjoys the luxuries of hauling water, chopping wood, and high speed internet. And uh, this is just an amazing story of someone living life probably very differently than most of us. Uh, I'm sure a few listeners out there are living similarly. Uh, I know a lot of you are because you, you, you ride in and say, uh, that, that that's actually something I hear back a lot is like, you know, it's nice when I listen to this show, people say this, by the way, uh, to know I'm not the only crazy one out there, to know that other people are just as crazy, have the same insecurities, the same crazy ideas, the same desire to break away from the mold. And Nancy's story is going to make you feel that way if you at all have the same feelings. So, uh, you know, we're, two horse shows in a row, what are the chances? I'm going to tell you they're pretty slim, and uh, on the horizon, I don't see any other horse stories coming up. So to get, you, you're getting your horse fix this week uh, ahead of Christmas and uh, Kwanzaa and Hanukkah and whatever you celebrate. Um, but let's go ahead and jump in. This is an amazing story, one of the really, really awesome stories from our archives, and Kurt Linville was the host here. So let's go ahead and jump in. Hello, friends. Thank you again for listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast. Kurt here. I have Nancy Pfeiffer on the horn here today, and she has an amazing story to tell. This story is about culture. It's about adventure travel. It's about connecting with people and a landscape in a way that few people get the opportunity to do. It started in 1999 when Nancy decided to go to Patagonia on the Chile side. She wanted to encounter the land and the people in the way that the the people encountered the land and each other, and that meant on horseback. So as a neophyte horsewoman, knowing very little Spanish, she went down to Patagonia and spent 10 years exploring Patagonia. She rode her horse over 3,000 kilometers in this process, Out of that grew a book that we're going to talk about today, Riding into the Heart of Patagonia. Nancy, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, you bet. I am so excited to hear about this. I mean, when I first saw what you had done, 
I thought we we uh, we frequently interview people about a trip that they did, or an expedition, a climb, or maybe about a sport that they do repeatedly. But rarely do I get the opportunity to interview someone about a decade of life. <laughs> you know what I mean? A decade spent learning a land and a people and and a culture in that way. So I'm excited to to hear about all of this. So Nancy, let's rewind a little bit. I understand this started because you went down to Patagonia, uh, did a little backpacking, you were a Knowles instructor, and then you you realized that the way to really do this was to spend more time and to do it on horseback. Yep. So what made you make that decision to uh, to to take on this this extended experience on horseback there? Um, I think I'll I'll take you to the the first the first page of the book if I could. Sure, um, you bet. So yeah, this is Patagonia in 1993. It's actually still three years before I actually do it and take you know take off across Patagonia alone on horseback. And a man approached on his horse. His mount, a rusty red beauty, sported the sport short trimmed mane and neatly squared off tail of a well-kept mount. Colorful hand-woven saddlebags tied behind a sheepskin-covered saddle held groceries from town. The man wore goatskin chaps, a woolen poncho, and the jaunty black beret, typical of the region. Crinkles around his eyes spoke of years of squinting into the sun. This man and his horse belonged to this place in a way I could only dream of. He paused on the banks of the rain-swollen river to stare at us, a group of college students, up to our knees in mud and dwarfed by huge backpacks. Wet and hungry, we had been stacked up on the wrong side of the river for days. Our next food supply, a few kilometers away on the other side. He looked perplexed. We had tents. We had expensive rain jackets. We obviously had money, but we had no horses. ¿Por qué no tienes caballos? He asked as he rode into the river. The strong current piled up around his horse's belly. The man gently lifted his feet from the stirrups and placed them on the horse's rump so as not to wet his boots. As, he, as his horse strode confidently through the water, that moment I knew I wanted to travel this country like the people who lived here. I longed to know this place as only one on horseback can. Having ridden horses only a few times in my life, I knew practically nothing about them. This was irrelevant. There was a 13-year-old girl inside of me who desperately wanted a horse. Mm. Wow. So then it, it, after that, you had 10 years of experiences it kind of encapsulate that for us, put some parameters around it so we understand how it kind of all transpired. Yeah, actually, um, more like 20 years. Um, so it, it took me three years from knowing I wanted to do this to having been on a horse a few times in my life and actually getting the guts to do it. Um, so in, in 1993, I took off. Um, I couldn't get anybody to go with me, um, so I went alone. And... Um, I think my first leg of the journey ended up being three or 400 miles headed basically south on a, on a horse. And over the course of the next 10 years, basically the people of Patagonia took me in and they taught me what I needed to know um, Mm. about horses. And then also just a lot about life and living and, and um, you know, perseverance and things that come from living in a really harsh landscape. Um, and slowly but surely, I kind of fell in love with the place. And initially, I was pretty much a tourist on a horse, but I became much more immersed in that. And then um, in 2007, there was a huge push to dam Patagonia's largest rivers. And the people of Patagonia were adamantly against that. And all of a sudden, these people were now my friends and their problems were my problems. I ended up riding in the Cabalgata San Represas, which was a 330 kilometer horseback ride in protest of the dams. We started as 30 people in the town of Cochrane, um, and we rode into the capital uh, town of Coyhaique at uh, 125 people on horseback. Nice. You know, I heard of that ride. That ride is, has gotten some acclaim around the world now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, in, in the end, um, it worked. The, the Bakker and the Pasco River um, are not slated to be dammed. Um, So, you know, it was a grassroots environmental protest on horseback um, that actually came to to good fruition. So, 
being involved in that ride was was kind of a life changing experience to ride beside the the sons and daughters of the people who who settled the land and whose farms were potentially going to be flooded was just a an amazing honor. Mm. Uh, and I felt like I needed to tell their story. So this story begins with me taking off across Patagonia and ends in the plaza with 125 horses on the protest ride. And then I, the other, I probably did another thousand miles or so after that. So there's a lot more miles after the book um, <laughs> that uh, of me wandering aimlessly around Patagonia horseback on horse because I love it. <laughs> wow. I know personally that when I've traveled to an amazing area, it seems like there's never enough time to take it all in. And there's always that yearning. What would it be like to live here, to stay long enough to actually know the people and to know the weather and to know the land? Well, you did that. You took the time to actually get to know Patagonia on a level that very few Americans would ever get the opportunity to. And I'm jealous. I'm really jealous. I, and I, I looked at, you know, living in, in Patagonia for the rest of my life. I looked at that pretty hard. But now I, I'm here in Alaska and um, Patagonia is a huge part of my life. Well, you know, just riding a horse around Alaska would make a great program, too. <laughs> but <laughs> let's go back to Patagonia. I, I was pretty naive when it came to Patagonia. Here's what I, I knew about Patagonia. I'd seen the National Geographic pictures. I had known about the clothing line right? And the way that that had been marketed. That's about it. Forgive my ignorance, but it educate us a little bit. What is Patagonia and, and what kind of landscapes does it encompass? What's it really like? No, it's totally understandable. I, when I first told uh, one of my former employers up here um, that I had gotten a job in Patagonia, he thought I was going to work for a clothing manufacturing company. Uh, <laughs> right. so, yeah, Patagonia is, is a place um, it's not even a specific country. It's um, Patagonia encompasses both the southern ends of Chile and Argentina. The entire stories in this book take, take place mostly in the Aysen region of Patagonia, which is kind of the central region. So if you divide Patagonia from kind of where it starts to break up into islands to the southern tip of the continent, the section I was in was kind of in the middle of that. For those who might remember what South America does along the western coast there, it just fractures into thousands and thousands of islands. And if you get far enough south, you're in Terra de Fuego and all of that, right? So Patagonia is in this area where these islands are starting to break off of the mainland there. Yeah, and the, the, the Andes run kind of along the western edge of the continent, and everything west of the Andes is dense rainforest. Then there's a band of good pasture land. Then it becomes the Pampas, which is basically the desert as it, as it reaches out towards Argentina. Um, so most of the horse travel was, was along this good pasture land in about a 25 mile ride, or you could go from desert to jungle. Only on one particular trip did I dare go into the wet, dripping western part of Patagonia on a horse. <laughs> and how'd that turn out? Does that work? Uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was a tough trip. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Patagonia then, you've already said you've got rainforest, desert, and mountains, and this nice grazing land, right? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of landscape kind of compressed, I guess, by the Andes. Yeah, well, the Andes are kind of on the on the western edge. Yeah, so then it tapers off to, to pasture land and then out into the desert. And I travel kind of through all three of those landscapes. And it's pretty amazing. You stayed in, in Chile most of the time, I stayed correct? in Chile, yep. But when I'm on the um, eastern edge of Chile, it's very much like Argentina. Big open landscapes, um, big skyscapes, huge clouds, stacked lenticulars, um, very dry. You don't really need a trail because you can go almost anywhere. By the time you're on the west side, um, you, you have to have a trail. So I'm definitely standing on the backs of all of the people who've traveled before me because there's no way you can get a horse through there unless somebody has recently kept the trail maintained. And, you know, you've got vegetation in your face most of the day. Mm. Let's rewind a little bit. I would like to know more detail about your decision to go down there on horseback. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. Get ready, Ohio. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, is coming to the Buckeye State. 
And to kick things off, you can get started with $100 in free bets as an early sign-up bonus. Plus, when you sign up today with promo code OHIOSB, you'll be all set for when FanDuel goes live in Ohio. Then you can bet on all your favorite teams and all your favorite sports with $100 in free bets. Just download FanDuel's top-rated sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Ohio, this is your chance to get in on the action. Join today with promo code OHIOSB. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. 21 plus and present in Ohio. Bonus issued in non-withdrawable free bets that expire seven days after FanDuel accepts its first real money sports wager in Ohio on one Unique user identity verification required. Offer ends on the go-live date. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Venture X from Capital One is the travel card for people always asking, Where next? You earn 10x miles on hotels and rental cars and 5x miles on flights booked through Capital One Travel and 2x miles on everything else you buy with Venture X. Plus, receive premium travel benefits like access to over 1,300 airport lounges. The Venture X card from Capital One. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com for details. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. Now we know we know your motivation. You were there, you saw it, and you said, that's the way to be here. That's what we've got to do. <laughs> but there's a lot more to this story. There are very few women who say, I'm going to go to a country where I don't know the language, and I'm going to go in a, my mode of travel being horseback, though I really don't know that much about horse care and, and, and horse riding and that sort of thing, right? How did you get to the point where you were confident enough to say, I'm going to do this? Um, that's, that's a little bit crazy, but that's kind of my mode. (laughs) I tend to take off on a lot of kind of crazy trips. You know, sometimes I can talk people into it and, and sometimes I can't. Having horses and learning about horses and having horses in my life had been a dream since I was, you know, that 13 year old girl who desperately wanted a horse growing up, growing up in suburbia. And at 38, I decided okay, I'm going to learn to ride horses. And I took horseback riding lessons with 13-year-old girls (laughs) in a ring. (laughs) Nice. And uh, learned as much as I could. Mm. So the horse is a major part of the culture and the lifestyle in this region. Share a little bit with us about that. Yeah, it, it's changing as well. The automobile is definitely coming in, but there, you know, there's still a lot of farms that are only accessible by horseback. People they go to town to get groceries on horseback. They go visit their neighbors on horseback. Kids go to school on horseback, and so by traveling by a horse, you get you get two things: you get you know just the incredible joy of traveling on a horse, but also you get taken in like one of the neighbors. So all of a sudden, mm. you're not you know, like a strange person fr- from some other country. If you come in on a horse, it's, it, it's somehow different. You're, you're, you're taken in and pretty soon you're sitting around talking about the cows and you know, the people in the last Valley and you know, you know, kind of what's going on in the next Valley. And in a lot of ways you're the newspaper. So I just, I feel like I really got kind of taken in. And in a lot of ways, people of Patagonia put me under their wing and taught me what I needed to know. Can you tell us a story that kind of exemplifies that for us? How was it that the people took you under their wing and, and taught you? Okay, so at one point I'd reached the southern the southern end. I couldn't go into Argentina, um, and there was a big lake keeping me from going south. So I was kind of revamping my trip and um, turning around and going north, and I had just a, a day to spend, and I'm out riding. And there's uh, a couple of men and about a hundred goats and they're, they're moving a, they're moving a herd of goats. And I see them in the morning and, and we pass saludos and say hello. And um, I see them again in the afternoon and they're taking their, their afternoon break. And they do the very common thing there, which is to call out mate amiga, um, which is, you know, come have tea friend. And so I stop, we drink their traditional tea, which is a, the mate um, it's kind of done anytime you meet someone. You, you have this mate drink. And then we proceed to roast up some goat over the fire. And then everybody kind of falls asleep for a nap in the sun. And I'm thinking, in what other part of the world is it completely acceptable for a woman alone to stop for tea, have a big meal and fall asleep in the, in the sun with two men and a hundred goats? 
<laughs> and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's that kind of easy hospitality. I mean, how many of us could just open our door and holler out, it, holler out into the road, hey, do you want to come in for tea to some stranger? And yet that happens all the time down there. It's really normal. And it's a wonderful kind of way to live. That's neat. That's neat. I would assume this happens a lot then if this is the norm, mm-hmm. right? So you really got to know the people quite well then. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I have definitely some people who are lifelong friends down there now. Why did you choose Patagonia? Let's go there for a little bit. What was unique about Patagonia that made you want to spend that much time there? Mm, I think I love all wild places. I mean, Patagonia is, it's even Alaska 50 or 100 years ago as far as like the level of development. That's neat. So how tall are the Andes in that part of Patagonia where you were? How big are the mountains there? Um, that, that's a good question. I, they're, they're not super tall, like 9,000 feet maybe. So substantial, especially because you're starting at sea level essentially, right? Yeah. And you're so far south that, you know, permanent snow line is, I don't know, exactly 5,000 or something. So, you know, Definitely big, still big glaciated peaks. Well, speaking of that, tell us about the climate and the weather down there. Again, it goes with that that east west flow. Um, the The eastern part is super dry. It's hot. I talk about it like um, living living inside of a blow dryer. The only thing the entire country has in common is it's windy. <laughs> the western side is 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 rain and wind um and the eastern side is is sun and wind but yeah it's the only thing that sticks down into the into the roaring 40s and so the the uh the wind leaves patagonia it goes all the way around the earth and it hits landfall again on the other side of patagonia um, <laughs> which is unique so the winds can cycle around antarctica there over and over again and the one little hiccup along the way is patagonia Yep, and then the Andes stick up and catch it all. Wow. You know, the active volcanoes, um, big storms, raging rivers. It's it's a spectacular place. And you know, I think in a lot of ways, that's why I felt so strongly that it was worth, like, this place cannot succumb to kind of our never-ending quest for more. Right. Um, us somehow protect this wild place. So what is being done to protect it? Well, at this moment, the big the big threat to Patagonia was damming the Bakker and the Pasco, Pasco River. And that's kind of the tip of the iceberg in that they have a lot of cheap energy there in the form of free-flowing rivers. You know, there's a world out here hungry for cheap energy. And one of the things um, that that would bring would, would bring all kinds of industry like aluminum smelters and things that are looking for cheap energy into Patagonia. And um, I think the president of Chile said it best at one point was in Puerto Aysen, where they were talking about putting in a big aluminum smelter and looked at, you know, the tremendous mountains and this beautiful fjord and said, this is no place for an aluminum smelter. So, Nancy, do you know, were these foreign interests that were wanting to build these dams or was it more internal to Chile or, you know, what was going on politically there? Yeah, I can't really speak, you know, too deeply politically what was going on. But I know that, yeah, the people of Patagonia did not feel like um, they were getting getting a good deal. I can't speak for every single person in Patagonia either, but but all of the people I knew were adamantly against this. Yeah, you know, the, the they were not, no one there would get electricity out of the deal. All the electricity was going north. Right. Yeah, they, they definitely felt like, you know, they didn't want it to happen. Otherwise, I don't think I would have joined the Kabbalgata and written a book about it and everything because I feel very strongly that it's, it's you know, it's their place to decide. I think it was incredibly innovative. How do you get a bunch of people who live scattered across a landscape and in small towns and villages to have a voice? Um, their answer to that was to hold a cavalgata, to 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 do a horseback ride and pick up people along the way and go stand in the plaza. I just thought that that's an incredible, innovative thing to do. Yeah, it, there's something so beautiful about the concept. People that they live their lives in some hybrid way with the old ways, right? And those ways still matter, and that they reach to what you know is considered an old way 
but with still their modern way, they reach to the horse and they reach to their mode of travel to go to the modern area and say, listen, we are a people and this is us. This is our way. And you can't take that away. And the thing I got from, you know, just being invited into Mate and in hundreds of homes was a real sense of people who, who feel like they have enough. Um, rural Patagonia isn't des- desperately poor. People, you know, to a large extent, they have a house, they have food, they, you know, every child goes to school. Um, and that they're very, they're very proud of what they have. And they, they know enough of the outside world to know that there's some reason that everybody comes to Patagonia and just goes, wow, what you have here is so incredible. Mm. Um, they, they, a lot of them know enough to know that, that everywhere isn't like that, <laughs> that, you know, there are places with too many cars and, and, you know, a lot of them have been to Santiago and don't want to live in Santiago. <laughs> well, what does it mean to you that they know that they have enough? Translate that for us. Mm. It seems like conversations don't necessarily revolve around what somebody has just bought or is is wanting to buy. Um, Kind of a level of contentment I I often don't feel outside of Patagonia. You didn't tell me you were going to ask hard questions. (laughs) It is a hard (laughs) question. One of the reasons I ask is because in my limited travels, I, I made it to Kenya and there was perspective there that the West had it all, that the West was rich and that everyone needed to have what the West had. It was really kind of awkward because that wasn't my feeling. The people had kind of been sold the American dream from, you know, five, six, seven thousand miles away. And I'm not going to say the American dream is bad. I'm just going to say that it it changed their, their perspective of their own lives. They weren't satisfied. They didn't feel like they had enough. I think that that is coming to some people in some parts of Patagonia as well. Um, I think television was really late getting to Patagonia. I did not personally know anybody who had a television until the late 90s. Yeah, I can't say, you know, I can't say it's not there and it's not coming. um, But that was the impression I got. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because uh, the only constant is change, right? (laughs) And we know that that no people will stay the same forever and no landscape will stay the same forever. But it's just kind of amazing that you were able to find people who had that degree of, of satisfaction with their environment, with their occupations, with their possessions, with their families, with their friends, with their culture. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. And it's something that I think requires a lot of wisdom. And uh, I just I, I find that fascinating that that was something that you noticed when you were there. Mm-hmm. They, they taught me a lot and it wasn't all about, you know, how to saddle a horse and milk a cow. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, do you have another excerpt from the book? Um, yeah. So I'd like to take you to the end of the book when we're about ready um, to ride into the capital with the Cabalgata Sin represses. Three abreast rows of well-groomed horses extended over hills and around bends farther than I could see. Riders carrying banners from their home regions, Rio Neff, Rio del Salto, Puerto Batran, Via Castillo. We moved not as a band of trail-weary, beaten-down campesinos with hundreds of kilometers behind us. Instead, we marched with flags flying as if in a parade. Several kilometers from the edge of town, a chubby 10-year-old boy in a red and gray, gray sweatshirt became our first official greeter. He stood alone beside the road, holding a handwritten sign above his head, Bienvenidos a Coyhaique, no a las represas. Welcome to Coyhaique, no to dams. Mm. Outside of town, new houses had sprung up like the legendary Casa Brujas nearly overnight. Unlike the original settlers who had nestled mo- modest homes into the hollows of the countryside to escape the Patagonia wind, these were opulent structures poorly placed on the landscape, suburban houses sprouting up on what had recently been farmland. It was happening all over the world. A not-so-gentle reminder that the population of the planet had doubled in my lifetime. As we entered Coyhaique, our reception was well beyond anything I had imagined. Calle Pratt was packed. People stood waving on top of cars draped with banners proclaiming No Endesa and Rios Libre. Pancho's wife, Cucci, held chubby one-year-old Lorenzo in one arm and waved wild at me with the other. Cory and his wife, Malinka, and their new baby girl, Mila, cheered us on from the other corner. 
Gone was the horse parking lot at the edge of town. A giant Sodimac, the Chilean version of Home Depot, stood in its place. These days, even during the afternoon siesta, the square bustled with people in business suits. The pleasant small town I had come to 15 years ago has somehow become a city. Waves of dark heads filled the streets and flowed into the plaza as we marched down the Calle Prat. Hundreds of tiny Chilean flags waved by riders and watchers alike reminded me that these people were not here to resist Chile. They were here because they loved their country and they wanted to protect it. We were not the only people who had traveled a long way to be here that day. Signs marked the gathering areas for people from outlying communities. Bahia Murta, Tortel, Rio Tranquilo, Manuales, Niriwao. I saw folks from Coyhaique and Lago Verde. I caught glimpses of people I hadn't seen in years. My urge to stop and share a beso with friends had pushed aside by the momentum of the parade. I could only wave wildly as familiar faces appeared and then disappeared in the crowd. My spirit soared with the power of waving flags and yelling in unison. Endesa entiende, la vida no se vende. Endesa understand, life is not for sale. But while observing a moment of silence outside Endesa, Hydro Asen's office in Coyhaique, I cried silently into my sunglasses. Hmm. I love what you said there, that the people aren't there to fight against Chile. They're there because they love it. They yeah. want to protect it. That's beautiful. Yeah, a, a, you know, a crowd of people, everyone with a tiny Chilean flag. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, you make me want to have been there. Yeah, it was a historical event. Yeah, no doubt about it. So the book, again, is Writing into the Heart of Patagonia by Nancy Pfeiffer. And Nancy, I'm going to spell your last name for everybody. That's P-F-E-I-F-F-E-R. So Nancy... How can people get a hold of the book? What's the status of the book right now? Okay, so it is on um, what they call pre-order, which means you can order the book, but it won't be delivered until um, May 1st. May 1st is the release date for the book. And then after May 1st, it'll be in bookstores and things. You can get it right now for pre-order on Amazon um, or through my website, nancypfeiffer.com, or through just type in writing into the heart of patagonia.com and you can pre-order it there. And then, like I said, after May 1st, it'll be in your, you know, on IndieBound and your local bookstore. And I'm on your site right now, nancypfeiffer.com. And I've been enjoying kind of uh, looking through all the different pictures in your gallery while you're telling me about it. And it just brings it to life for me. Such an amazing landscape and beautiful people. Your website's awesome. I also have to tell you that uh, all of those photos are from my hub husband, Frederick Norsell. Oh, that's fantastic. So I wasn't married when uh, I did the trips that are in this book, but like I said, I did another thousand miles or so afterwards, and he came with me on a few of those trips. Pretty much most of all of the images um, are his. Well, I saw his name on the prints, and I was thinking, well, how does that work in? And I'm glad you explained it. The pictures are just breathtaking. And it makes me want to go. It makes me want to see it for myself. Mm. Well, hey, will you tell us what it was like, just kind of in general, to see a landscape like this from horseback? What was a day like? Can you just kind of take us through the rhythm of, of the experience? Um, yeah. I uh, One thing I learned during my, my travel was what is a traveling day and what isn't. Um, <laughs> I Initially, I would travel on pretty much every kind of a day. Some of the locals would look at me and just like, why are you traveling on a day like this? It is blowing and raining horizontally. So I think I learned, you know, I learned what would be the word for that. It just where I went or when I went wasn't of any great importance to anybody on the planet. So, <laughs> yeah, it was more about being there. Yeah, on a, on a traveling day, I'd get up, I'd probably enjoy some mate or some coffee and breakfast while I watch my horses graze. I, I just really enjoy watching horses graze. Mm. And then uh, you know, I, I go get the horses, saddle them up, had a, a pack horse. I did some legs of the journey with other people. Um, so once I'd done a couple legs, people started to have confidence and be willing to join me. So we'd saddle up the horses and you know, ride all day. The The trails could be anything from pretty easy, fast going, but but most of the time they were they were rugged. There'd be you know, maybe a crux river crossing that day or a really treacherous mud wallow. Days that I didn't lose the trail were really rare. <laughs> Days that there was no epic and, and nothing of note to to write down in my journal were incredibly rare and precious. Some of the trails that I did 
One of them hadn't been traveled probably in seven years. So it was pretty, pretty overgrown, hard to find the trail. A lot of the trails that I, I did, I tended to travel early in the season. So maybe nobody had been over that pass yet that year. So, yeah. But I, I also liked how having to find the trail, work your way through the landscape, kept your brain engaged. Um, oh, yeah. where there were sections I had to do along dirt roads and along the highway. And they were just, just separated by this strip of, of gravel, like, you know, two cars wide. It, it took my brain out of the out of the mode of, of being as engaged in the landscape as when you have to really keep on it to find the trail. Um, and I found road travel incredibly boring. <laughs> well, it's kind of fun here. You know, you admittedly called yourself a, a neophyte horsewoman when you started this, but you were not a neophyte woodswoman. Um, it, you were a Knowles instructor and quite comfortable in the wilderness. Yeah. Yeah, that was was nothing new to me. So how much experience would someone need to have and how adept do they need to be at the wilderness lifestyle if they were to try to go down and do something similar in Patagonia? On horseback? Or well, potentially, let's go with that. Sure. Okay. I felt I look back on it now and I look at like how little I knew about horses and how little I knew about Spanish. I would have hated to add added things like not knowing how to keep myself warm and dry in a in an incredible storm. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, not knowing, you know, how to, you know, pack food and not knowing how to cross a river in general, whether you're crossing on a horse or on foot. I think that that would have been a, a lot to, to add to the to the picture. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, reading a map is absolutely mandatory, but it's it's not all you need in that um, the trails were not often where they were marked on the map. Um, <laughs> wow. You have to read the lay of the land and, and generally know how to get to where you want to go then. Yeah. It said that there's three, three types of trails in Chile. Those that exist on the map, but don't exist in reality. Those that exist in reality, but aren't on the map. And those that are somewhere more or less where they're marked on the map. <laughs> so again, wow. like without a lot of people giving me direction along the way as well. You know, um, when you rode into somebody's compo, you generally would get lost because all of a sudden there's not one trail. There's 10 trails because you're near someone's house and you don't know which, which is the main trail and which is the trail that takes their cows to the pasture. So that also would deposit you on people's doorsteps. <laughs> which is kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Very rude. To, it would be incredibly rude to ride by. Wow. Well, here's a question for you. I visited with a, a lot of people from the U.K., and they do what they call wild camping. And the, re the reason they call it that is because they kind of jump behind a bush and go to sleep for the night on someone else's property. Mm -hmm. That really is what they're doing. And the reason they have to do that is because there's not a lot of public lands, you know, where they might be at the time. They have public lands, but it's just mostly private. And then I'm from the American West, where we have, you know, national forest land. We have wilderness areas. We have uh, BLM, Bureau of Land Management land. We have all sorts of public lands that are open for our exploration and use for camping, for biking, for backpacking, horseback riding. It's all here, as long as you know generally where you can go. When you're in Patagonia in Chile, was it mostly private property? Was it public property? And what's their concept of trespass? Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. I am so glad you brought that up because that is one of the key, key points. So there is public land, um, but most of the, the public land is kind of in the high mountains and it's, it's all within the, the private land. So you have to pass through private land to, to get to the public land. The culture has always been the, the horse trail is the road and, you know, the horse trail may go right up to somebody's house and on to the next. And the culture has always been, you know, passe, go ahead, come through. Unfortunately, people from outside, foreigners and people from Santiago buying land um, have begun to change that. You know, they come and they, they have the, the culture they came from and they put up fences and they put up locked gates and no trespassing signs. And then everything back of that valley um, is closed to you. So the, the days of being able to do the, the kind of horse trips that I do down there are, are very quickly 
potentially coming to an end. And, and it's, it's never been the law, but it's always been the culture that people could pass through. But, you know, the culture is changing with other people. And the other thing that's happening is the coming of the automobile, which means that the people are more capable to steal things. I've had people literally say to me, oh, don't worry, there's no bad people here. In other words, it's fine for you, you know, to, to, to camp and sleep here. It's fine for you to leave your saddle beside the road because there's no bad people here because I knew everybody in the valley. Right. Uh, you know, unfortunately, that's changing, too. As soon as you can drive a truck into there, then everybody, everybody on the planet can be there. Yeah. You know, I've had the wood stove stolen out of my cabin there. And the wood stove was stolen by somebody who had the kind of four wheel drive truck that I could never afford in order to get back into that cabin and steal that wood stove. So it, it is probably one of the biggest changes happening in Chile right now is the, the difference in outlook on private property. What do you think would happen if that part of Chile were overrun with tourists? I think tourism brings good things. It also brings bad things. Um, you know, the, the Aysen region has been one of the last regions to have any kind of tourism because it's not easily accessible from, from either side. You have to pretty much fly there or take a boat there. And, you know, a lot of my friends work in tourism and would like to have tourists come and have a, a genuine experience and, yes, leave a little bit of money behind. Yeah, sure. It just seems to me that um, you were encountering a culture and a people in their own way, and that the frequency of the tourism must be fairly low. You know, the, it still seems like it's authentic. Would that be the right word? Yeah, and 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 the Aysen region is quite hard to get to. You can fly there, or you can take a boat there, but the um, the Carretera Austral, the main north south highway, doesn't actually connect on either end, and so the the other huge issue there is the connection of the Carretera Austral. Some people really want it. I, I would say people really want the highway connected. But right now, it's one of the things I think that, that that's keeping Aysen a little bit quieter. So it's a blessing and a curse. Yeah, I, I feel like, yeah, most of the people, no matter how they feel about, you know, the dams and all those other things, um, most of the people actually do want the highway. Um, but I think a lot of them, too, have never seen that country and, and realized that where the highway would go would have to equal anything that Norway did as far as tunnels and mm. heading into mountainsides. And it, it's always going to be cheaper and easier to go through Argentina than to, to put a road through that part of Chile. Well, what a fascinating experience to have spent nearly 20 years of your life experiencing a landscape like that. How did that shape you as a person? I think I'm actually a different person when I'm in Chile than I am when I'm here, to be honest. I feel like I'm much more patient. I think it's definitely taught me perseverance. Like I have looked at things people do on a day-to-day -day level. Like one of my best friends was hitchhiking into town every day with her son, dropping him off at school, hitchhiking home, hitchhiking back in to pick him up, hitchhiking home again. And this was just, this was just normal. This is just like, well, it, it's lucky that we live close enough to town we can do that. And hitchhiking is very culturally accepted. Everybody does it because not everybody has cars. I look at that and I'm like, oh, my gosh, what an incredible burden. You know, like, why don't you have a school bus? And so I think it's been great for me to, to, to look at these things and, and kind of realize the, the kind of perseverance that people have. Mm. Um, a family who, whose land had been covered with three feet of ash um, by a volcano. And they were trying to, to uh, raise sheep, but all their sheep died. So they got cows because cows can eat bushes. Um, <laughs> and, you know, they were, they were sticking to it. They were going to stay on the farm. And, you know, their farm was three feet deep in volcanic ash. Wow. And yeah, that's, that's perspective, isn't it? Yeah. No, they, they, they had a couple of things to teach me about perseverance. It's like, okay, I might have had a rough day on the trail. But, you know, I was doing this on a lark as a vacation, you know, so a rough day on the trail is, is nothing compared to your farm being covered in ash. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, absolutely. So as a vacation, how tough was it? Is this a pretty rugged vacation, high adventure required? My idea of vacation is not everybody's idea of vacation. But that said, you, there are ways you can go down to Chile and you can do a horseback ride without doing what I did. You know, I've got friends who have horsebacking outfits and, you know, it's becoming possible for um, people to go down and, and, you know, maybe hook up with a local guide and go, go do the kind of trip I did without maybe, 
needing to devote 10 years to it if that's not your your deal. Um, <laughs> the 10 years of vacation is a lot. Well, yeah, or, you know, <laughs> it wasn't 10 years straight, but you know, without having to, to get all of those skills that I had to get and to take all the time, there is a way that you can go down and, and, and do some horse packing in Chile and, you know, get a feel for it. And if you fall in love with it as much as I did, then you can keep going for another 10 years. But yeah, it, it, it's certainly possible and accessible to, to pretty much everyone. Um, I would suggest if, if people do go down there to go down with a different time frame than your, your gringo time frame, though, like, Everything is going to take way longer than you expect. Right. Um, so don't don't try and go on a ten day trip to Chile. So maybe get a, a leave of absence from the office before you head down there. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, because if, if you go with you know a really short timeline, you know it's going to take a while to to get things rolling, and then you know maybe they're not going to be able to find the horses or whatever right away. Um, so it, it's just not quite. Um, you will be happier <laughs> if uh, if you've got some time. Oh, yeah. I can't imagine. Because you won't be butting your way against the way things work. You know, this this question may sound like it's coming out of left field a little bit, but this juxtaposition of the extreme weather that you described and the Patagonia clothing company that sells Patagonia Gore-Tex jackets and the Patagonian people that are running around in wool and cotton. For some reason, I just think, how do they manage the extreme weather? Yep, the typical Chilean horseback rider or gaucho's outfit is a pair of what we call goatskin chivas, which is are goatskin pants, a woolen poncho, and a wool hat. And for example, one day I came in riding into a friend's house and I'd been out probably about half of the day and I was in my name brand outdoor clothing. We won't say what name brand, but it's my okay. name brand outdoor clothing. But it, you know, it was old. I don't replace it very often. I don't have a ton of money. So it was old, but I was drenched to the bone, like wet all the way to the core. My friend comes back from being out. He's been out two thirds of the day. He shucks his wool poncho and his goatskin chivas. He's wearing a pair of cotton overalls underneath all of this, and he is dry. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Now, how does that work? Uh, The woolen poncho goes, you know, pretty close to your neck. It covers your arms. It goes all the way over the saddle, so it also keeps your saddle dry. You know, you've got a pair of tall boots, and you've got these goatskin pants that are also really warm. Yeah. Yeah, that's neat. You know, for thousands of years, humans managed without our our high-end Gore-Tex shells. They're (laughs) nice to have. They certainly make Everest a little bit more enjoyable. But people have found ways to work with mother nature and to, to manage. And I just think it's really cool. I was just curious. I have been known to wear a plastic bag with the the neck and the arms cut out inside of my raincoat. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're saying, why don't you just get one of our ponchos? <laughs> I eventually, eventually I did. Um, eventually I kind of went local in my, my dress, but I think initially I felt like, I wasn't a good enough horseback rider to dress like that and not feel like an imposter. <laughs> when you changed your clothing, did the people's attitudes toward you change at all? Mm, maybe, yeah, probably, yep. Yeah. I think, too, you know, by then I had several thousand miles under my belt. So, like, my attitude about what I was doing was was different. Initially, right. when people would ask me where I was going, I, I'd give them the, the name of the next lake or the next village, like there was no way I was telling anybody I was riding that horse 300 kilometers to, Co- to Cochrane, <laughs> you know, because, right. like, you know, definitely there were people who were like, oh, no, you can't do that. You're a gringa. Look at you. And besides that, it's obvious you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> you know, after I felt more confident, then, you know, people would ask me where I was going. I would tell them the truth. Well, what a fascinating experience. So, Nancy, do you have a way to summarize all of this? It's such a huge chunk of time and so many experiences. But is there a way in closing to kind of bring it all together so that we can kind of get a feel for the the full impact? Um, I feel like it's it is an adventure story. There's plenty of adventure in there, but it's really much more Patagonia story. And it's about landscape and culture and learning what it takes to care about place. Mm, what it takes to care about place. I love that. And once again, the name of the book is Riding Into the Heart of Patagonia by Nancy Pfeiffer, spelled with a P-F, Nancy Pfeiffer. And Nancy, I would encourage the listeners 
to go ahead and pre-order the copy. And the reason is because then it'll be such a pleasant surprise when it arrives in May. And if they don't do that, then when May comes around, there something else will be on the radar. So it sounds to me like this is a book that needs uh, it needs to be read, especially the idea of of this people and this culture and caring for place. I, I think it's a beautiful thing. So I, I highly encourage our listeners go ahead just just pre order right now, and that way when May comes you can you can tell yourself oh it's it's Christmas in May. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Well, Nancy, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the Adventure Sports Podcast and to share with us a little bit of uh, your life-changing experiences in Patagonia. It's uh, it's a beautiful story. And I also, everyone, go to Nancy's website, nancypfeiffer.com. Look at the pictures. I think it just brings it to life. It's It's so wonderful. But anyway, thank you, Nancy. All right, thank you. And for all of our listeners out there, you know, this show is all about getting people to get out there and have some fun. But the fun has a purpose. It has a reason. And maybe it's not 10, 20 years in Patagonia for you. But find something that will stretch your world and get out there and have some fun. First of all, thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun.